Daniel, todo con vos. Ok, so thank you for being here until today. And my plan for today is, uh, as I said yesterday, to continue, I mean, to talk a little bit about how to continue the flow and then to talk about non-compact solutions. But I want to start first uh, with some corrections on sign mistakes that I made yesterday and some improvements on some of the proofs from the conversations that I have had with uh, some of you. So let me start with some uh, erratas and improvements. And I will hopefully include them in the notes and, and send a, a corrected version. So one thing that, that I'm gonna sort of mention today, so, so it's good if I say it, when I talk about the principal curvatures, Uh, lambda 1 and lambda n, I'm thi always thinking that they have an order. So these are, are the eigenvalues. I think I never said it, so values of this matrix, of that matrix there. Um, in my distance comparison proof, the proof is correct, but there, there's a simpler version, I mean, there's a simplification that I didn't consider. Uh, increasing distance. Increasing distance. Proof. Actually, at the critical point, the gradient is zero because I, I, the rotation I, I did, and I forgot about that when I was writing the proof here. So if you check the proof again, you'll see that it's much easier I mean, what you wrote is what I wrote is correct, but this is this makes it much easier. And to prove uniqueness of uh, solutions of smooth solutions, <coughs> the easiest is to to use the the maximum principle at the equation that I wrote the first day. So write it as a graph and then over the initial condition and then use that equation and use comparison principle there. Smooth solution, uh, the easiest way. Is write solutions. maximum principle. And then this is about the lectures before, but about yesterday, uh, there was a sign mistake when I computed uh, the, the rescaled equation. Because, I mean, it's, it's a matter of uh, what do you think the mean curvature is? I mean, there, there's, a, there's a sign there on, on the choice of the normal, basically. Type one yesterday. Type one singularities should be df tilde dt. And then, because the way I'm choosing the sign, it should be like this and then like this. So the, the equation that the solitons, so self similar shrinkers. In, in this notation that I'm using for the for the, ex, the exterior normal, are, are things that satisfy uh, eight, 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 eight. 
tilde, the other way around, sorry. H tilde is F tilde dot, uh, dot mu. So this is exterior normal. And you can verify because the uh, sphere should satisfy this equation. And consequently, in, in my monotonicity formula, because I had a mistake here, I had a mistake, I think, in the sign of the monotonicity formula as well. So let me copy it uh, and see if this time I, I get the signs right. Uh, so monotonicity formulas, let me write them here. Um, the first one should be P of x naught, T naught, minus T, and this is going to be equal to minus, that, that's fine, and, and actually for all the arguments that I needed to do, I needed just uh, this sign here for the first part, for the convergence. It's not T not T, and the rescaled, the rescaled one. It's uh, I think I had a two missing maybe. Yeah, D D T Y squared, and I think. I forgot that too yesterday. M tilde t or m tilde t is gonna be minus, and it has to be consistent with that. So it's gonna be uh, minus h um, minus f tilde. And I'm missing here that. Yeah, so George more or less me mentioned this yesterday in his talk anyway. So yeah, these are sort of improvements on the proofs maybe to make the, them a bit simpler. Uh, here I had some signs missing because I, I was kind of running yesterday as probably you noticed. Uh, so let, after that, let me talk a little bit about uh, weak solutions. And on the field of weak solutions to mean curvature flow, so the idea here is try to find a way to continue the flow after the, the singular time. And there have been many approaches, and I, I'm going to mention four of them today. And I'm going to tell you what are the advantages and disadvantages of them. So I think this is more or less chronological. So uh, I'm going to start with brachyflow. And brachyflow is actually older than all this, all what I have talked about here. But Brachy, Brachy's thesis in the 70s, end of the 70s, he tried to set up mean curvature flow, but in the context of geometric measure theory. So very much related to the variable theory that uh, Rafael has been talking about in his class. And the idea here is, is, to, is to consider, consider flows that are, uh, consider the flow of variables. Of variables in an integral sense then. So, I'm going to write sort of a simplified version of, of what this is, but uh, here you consider then a family of measures. So this is a family of measures. Uh, with T in some interval that satisfies the following. Let me be careful with the signs here because I, 
I don't want to, I don't have another day to correct the signs this time. <laughs> um, so well, that, this is the, the easier part. It's uh, less or equal than minus h squared phi plus h dot s dot t phi d mu t. For every phi that is compactly supported, and this is the mean curvature vector. This here is the mean curvature vector. And this here, maybe in a different color, it's a uh, so it's, it's the projection on the, represents the projection on the tangent plane. So this is something that is actually well defined uh, for very general things, for very general measures, for, for variables, and it has the advantage that you can even do this for co dimensions that are higher than one, and you can make sense of a lot of the things that I, I talked about before. So many of the singularities that I had before, in this sense, they would not be singularities because for a measure, th those are not singular points. Or the, let's say you can sort of define the measure anyway. So. It works in a very general class of objects. Of objects and, and allows uh, easily singularities. Allows singularities. Works in any co dimension. So, so far everything seems very good, but it has two disadvantages. One is that, of course, the, the tools that you can use here are much more technical than the tools that I, I have been using here so far. It is a lot more technical to work with this flow. But okay, that means that you have to work more, so it's not necessarily bad. What is not so good though, is that it's not unique. The bad part, the, the really bad part of this flow is that solutions are not necessarily unique. example where, where it's sort of easy to see that what I'm saying is, is true. I mean, I don't know if it's easy, but at least I think I can convince you with a picture. Uh, that is the following. So this is my initial condition. The blue thing is my initial condition. Infinite lines. So in principle, I mean, this is something that seems to have zero curvature everywhere, right? So it's itself a solution. So I don't know. How, some of you may know that this is not locally area, I mean, length minimizing. So here, this is not the best that you can do if you're trying to minimize length. So this is not in the spirit what I defined the first day. So it's not necessarily something that is trying to minimize length. So let me show you another solution here. 
One possibility is that actually if you consider these two half lines, there is one solution that I will talk about in a minute that comes out of that, that is asymptotic to that. And I can do the same thing with these two other lines. So this is also a solution. So this is a solution. But this is rotationally symmetric, right? So if this is a solution, the rotation of that is also a solution. It's a different solution. So. And this is not all. I still have two more two more solutions in here. And one of them, it's really sort of more like in the spirit of being, being area minimizing, and it's something that looks like this. So it's something that has a curve here, a point there, and then, and this is actually 120 degrees, all of them. That's also a solution. And I'm not going to draw anything else, but, assume, but again, because this is rotationally symmetric, I have the rotation of that also being a solution. So I have many solutions. And all of these are Bracky flows. All of these satisfy the Bracky uh, inequality here. So it's, it's highly non-unique. I mean, this is an example with curves. Imagine the things that can happen in higher dimensions. Okay, so good and bad. I mean, it has good things, but it has also bad things. I'm not going to prove it here, but it's not so hard to prove that if you have a smooth solution to mean curvature flow, it's also a Bracky solution. So all smooth solutions are bra Bracky solutions. Let me make a note here, all smooth. Solutions. Yeah, so that part it works well. Uh, okay, let me give you another definition of weak solution. So the level set method is called this. The level set method is it was developed probably the early 80s by two different, I mean, these appear in two different papers more or less at the same time. All the references are, are, are in the note, but this was Evans, Evans and Sprague, and then uh, Gidas, uh, Giga, Goto, and Chen. Yes. And the idea is the following. So suppose that the surface is a level set of something, of a function. I'm thinking that m of t is going to be dx such that u of x t is equal, I mean, it doesn't matter. I'll choose zero there as, as the little set of this, but it could be a little set of other constant. That's really not, not relevant for this. Then let's assume that, that I have this equality for every, for every level set actually, like every level set is something that is evolving by mean curvature flow. Then you can see that uh, the, the derivative of this, so I, I get that the UDT uh, plus green of U, now this is something that depends on T because of this equation, so it's times dx dt, 
is equal to zero. And this thing, thing here, it's a, I want to assume that it's evolving by mean curvature flow. So it's a, the UDT minus h dot nu dot the gradient of u is zero. But because this is a level set, I know how to compute all these things in terms of u. And, and what this tells you is that, uh, in fact, that in fact what I have is that the UDT, uh, this is the divergence of, you can check that this is, because this is a level set, is the divergence of that vector. And then this is the normal that I know how to compute as well. And I get this equation here. So I get an equation that is actually parabolic, quasi-linear for you. And I have some initial condition that sort of describe the initial surface. So we say that U is a level set solution or that M is defined by a level set solution if U satisfies this equation in, a, in some weak sense. So U is a level set solution. if you satisfies the equation in a viscosity sense, which is very weak. So I'm not gonna go into detail of what this means, but basically that means that I need a function that is continuous that in some sense is satisfying this, but it's only continuous. So it's, it's quite weak. And actually for this is it's some work, but it's not so hard to prove that if you start with an initial condition that is Lipschitz, then you always have a solution for all times. Actually, if you, uh, I didn't bring in any of that, but, uh, but if you Google it, for instance, you can see what happens in the case of the Tumbel example that I showed before. You can find a solution like this and it shows exactly how the singularity is gonna look like in this context. Okay, so I mean, in some sense it's good because you have a, a PDE here that is more regular than the thing that I was working with before. But of course, it, it cannot be perfect, right? I mean, they, they have to have something bad because you know, the other one has something bad. So a question would be, for instance, what happens if my initial condition is this blue thing in this case? And the answer is, it's a little bit strange at first. Uh, so for the same initial condition, what is gonna be the level set? So Maybe I'll use the same picture and a different color for that. And in this example, the level set for all positive times is actually all that part. So it's something that is not a surface anymore. It's something that is fat. You, you fill in all this thing here. So actually, that, that phenomena, the fact that you can develop an interior is what they call fattening because something that was a thin set becomes a fat set. So the problem of this thing is that solutions may have fattening. May have fattening and that means uh, that sets the develop an interior, a non-end interior, a level sets. And this is uh, actually 
very much related to the fact that the Bracky flow is not unique. I mean, at the end, in, in many ways, these two, these two weak solutions are the same thing. So when you have non-uniqueness on the Bracky flow, it's usually because you're gonna have fattening in the level set flow. So you more or less can choose what you want to work with. And the other disadvantage that has this method is that it only works for co-dimension one, or has only been studied for co-dimension one. But then again, everything that I've done here more or less only works for co-dimension one, so. And there's a disadvantage to both of these approaches. Uh, for the ones of you that have heard a little bit about the proof of the Poincaré conjecture of Perelman's proof, Perelman's proof is uh, based on the fact that every time that you have a singularity, you cut out the singularity and continue the flow. But you want to do topologi topological class classification, so you want to know how the singularity looks topologically. So both of these approaches somehow don't see any of the topology changes that happen at the singularity. That's not so good. So there was a, a recent, well, maybe not so recent, maybe like almost 10 years ago, but there was a recent attempt to develop what is called mean curvature flow with uh, surgery. this means, but basically this means that when you come to a singular time, you want to cut the singularity and replace that by uh, something that is more regular, like two spheres or the number of spheres that you need when you're cutting topology. So this means that uh, cut the singularity. And, and add a more regular part. But as in the case of Perelman, the problem with that is that you really need to know very well how the singularities look like. And as we talked about yesterday, I don't even know if singularities two, type two happen, right? I mean, so I certainly don't know how all the singularities look like. And so the problem of this is that you really need to know a lot more about the singularities that is known in general. It needs a lot of information. On the singularities. So, there's a theorem by Husken and Sinistrati. That prove that this works if you if the initial surface is uh, too convex. And that means that the two smaller eigenvalues, the two smaller uh, principal curvatures are uh, add up to something that is positive. And this is something that is preserved by the flow. And the proof is very technical. It's a very long paper. And what they basically, basically prove in this case is that all singularities are either spheres or cylinders. In this case, all singularities are spheres. So you can also do topological classification of this type of, of uh, surfaces. In this case, uh, this is actually, actually their work is only for n bigger than three and then there's a later one by Brendan Kusken that is the case n equal two. Let me add it here. Uh, 
all singularities are all cylinders. And there's a proof uh, that it sort of simplifies this proof. This was a little bit simplified by, so this was simplified recently by uh, Hasselhofer and Kleiner. And it looks like their approach may work for things that are more general, but it's not, it's not so clear. So far, I mean, it's only a simplification of that result. It's just, it uses a, a different technique. Okay, so, so I think I, this is all I will say about uh, weak solutions. But as you see, I mean, there, there are many things to do here and it's uh, sort of a, a very technical approach. I mean, in this part, there are many things to be done. The, the other two cases that I discussed, in particular the level set flow, is, it's true that it's not good for topological classification, but it has been used for other things. For instance, to prove uh, isoperimetric inequalities. Because in that case, you only need to know the symptotic behavior at the end of the flow. You don't need to know everything that is happening in between. So it, it's good for other things. Uh, and there, there are some results on that direction, not only on this flow, but on other flows. And actually there's a proof of the Penrose conjecture using inverse mean curvature flow that basically what they do is understand very well what happens with this, this type of approach. And in the remaining time, that is not very long, so I don't know how much I will be able to say, I want to talk a little bit about non-compact evolutions because everything that I've said so far is about compact solutions and I think in the, in the part of non-compact evolutions, really not very ma many things are known. So, I mean, there are a lot of open problems in, in this area. In the other part, there are a lot of open problems, but they're very hard. <laughs> so, I, mean, I think the problems there may be not so, so hard to, for someone that wants to start in the subject. So, the first thing that, that I'm gonna tell you about is probably like the first re result of this type that is uh, uh, entire graphs over our, Rn. Rn. So I'm thinking that my my solution now, I mean my evolution is something that looks like u of x t uh, with this in Rn. Oh, sorry, that's it. And then of course what you want for this is to see what the equation looks like, so I'm, I'm gonna take time derivative of this, and I'm not gonna compute it, but it's very, it's kind of easy to compute. That means, that this means that this should be equal to basically the mean curvature of that. and then you have some initial condition. So it's very similar to the equation that I wrote before, but it's slightly better because you have that one here. So that makes it as a PDE, a, a better PDE. And the result that, that was proved, that is actually kind of nice, this is a, a theorem by Ecker and Fusken. That in contrast with almost everything that we've seen so far, these solutions exist for all times. Solutions exist for all times. Are graphical and exist for all times. Or remain graphical, I guess. Remain graphical and exist for all times. say it's a little bit of a simplification of, of what they really say, but if the, the growth at infinity is linear, they can also say how this behaves at infinite time. It's 
linear. Uh, I'll be, if I have time, I'll be more precise about this. So, and then you have the following. You have that, I'm calling it M, I guess. Mt converges as t goes to infinity to an M infinity that satisfies um, that the mean curvature is equal to minus f or x or you know whatever the parameterization is satisfies this equation here. So this looks very similar to the type one, like myself, similar shrinking solutions that I had before. So these actually are models for solutions of mean curvature flow that are, are expanding. So these are expanding solutions. So are solutions that have the same shape for all times, but they uh, expand, they, they get bigger for all times. So these are expanding cell similar solutions. And actually you saw one example of this already a minute ago. There are exactly the ones that come from this theorem. And I think I already raised the picture, but uh, I will draw it in a, again. So basically this in particular says that if I have two lines or two planes or anything like that, then there is a solution that is like that. So this is a self-similar expanding solution. So the example that I showed you before of the cross, the, the solutions that I drew, I drew first were these self-similar expanding solutions that uh, Husken and Ecker found when they were proving this theorem. And actually, this condition at time zero, what you see basically when you rescale is just the behavior at infinity. You see the cone at infinity. And in general, if you have any smooth cone, then you're going to have a self-similar expanding solution coming out of the, that cone. Okay, so at least we have one case that solutions are more regular. And yeah, so uh, what I wanted to do, but I think I won't have to, time to do, is sort of give you an idea of the proof of this theorem, but not, not completely, and, and to prove this here. There are different ways of proving this. I mean, one way is just using maximum principle several times. So it's, it's quite a bit of work, but it, it's something that we can do with what, it ha what we have seen here. And also you try, can try to use a monotonicity formula. So uh, let me just mention this, although I'm not, I don't think I'm going to have time to do it. But the monotonicity for the rescale monotonicity formula that I proved before, uh, and George mentioned this before yesterday in his talk, so if you, so this is the monotonicity formula that we had yesterday. And basically one can show that self-similar shrinking solutions are um, minimal surfaces with this metric, basically, with the metric defined by this. So self-similar expanding solutions are actually minimal surfaces for that metric. This metric in some sense it's good because it has negative curvature, but it's not so easy to work with because if I put any m of t here, because the growth here is very strong, this may not be finite. So you have to work a little bit, you have to localize the, the monotonicity formula to be able to work with that. But yeah, I don't think I'll have time to, to go into that. If anyone wants to know more about that, you can ask me later, but uh, yeah, I wanted to mention that. And that in particular tells you that all, uh, Self-similar expanding solution are, are things that decay very fast at infinity. They're, they're very, they're very, very, very linear. Okay, so 
I wanted to mention two more results just to tell you that the situation in, uh, for non-compact things is you have all sorts of phenomena. I'll mention one thing that you sort of can deduce from what we talked yesterday. So remember that I had my example with my hyperboloid that I, I drew. Uh, so I had something that is rotationally symmetric and, and this was shrinking in finite time, this would collapse. So now you can sort of try to think the same thing about something that is non-compact here. So if the evolution exists, you know that this is gonna have a singularity in finite time anyway. So it could be infinite and still have a singularity in finite time that is not that is disappearing to a line like a cylinder. So there's a result that is, I think, rather surprising and I, it's in the notes written in all, all detail. I don't know if I want to write it in all detail, but one can consider rotationally symmetric surfaces and one can actually have the following phenomena. symmetric surfaces. And this is a result by, uh, let's see, Giga, Seki, and Umeda. And they show that you can actually have, depending on how is your initial condition, that something that is uh, non-compact becomes compact in finite time. Rotationally symmetric. Rotationally symmetric. May become compact in finite time. Or you can have you can have all sorts of combination of phenomena here because basically what you're thinking is that your initial condition is something that could be, could be very strange but rotationally symmetric. And mine is not very rotationally symmetric but uh, <laughs> this was supposed to be, you can imagine that it's rotationally symmetric. So what could happen is that you can lose one end or both end and become compact or, may, or not, not at all. I mean, you can, like in this example, if the things open very fast, it may, may happen that you have singularities, but it doesn't become compact at all. Okay, so. The, the theorem stated like with all precision in the notes, I'm not gonna do it here because I, I would take all the time and I just wanted to mention one more sort of surprising result in the last 10 minutes that I have. And it's, uh, it's a work that is actually by myself and, and Oliver, Oliver Schnurer. And what we consider here is uh, graphs that are bounded on one direction so bounded below, graphs are proper over some uh, subdomain sub subset of Rn. Uh, let me start with, with a simple example that you more or less will believe that I'm saying is true and then I'll give you an example that you won't believe that what I'm saying is true. Uh, so, for instance, take a ball and take a graph over a ball, something that goes to infinity. So, something that is not very hard to think about is that if, if I have a ball here, I can consider the cylinder associated to that ball, right? And if I have a comparison principle, what I would expect is that, in fact, uh, the graph cannot exist for all times. So, actually, this should have at least a singularity before or at the time that this happens. So what our theorem says is that when you have a domain and a graph over the domain, then the solution is graphical for all times that the domain exists, basically. You make evolve the domain and then you have a graph over that evolving domain and it disappears at the same time, exactly the same time as the graph. And le then let me 
show you a picture why this is, that sounds very reasonable with that example, but it doesn't sound so reasonable, reasonable with other examples. So let me write maybe the theorem, if I, a short version of the theorem at least. Um, yeah, I don't, be a bounded open set. Um, Oliver would kill me if he sees me doing this, but I, I will not write the hypothesis all, all, all of them very carefully. So I will say that u0 goes to infinity as x go to the boundary, and this is also Lipschitz. Uh, and I will also assume that this is bigger than some constant that could be large but negative. Then there is a solution. There is a set omega. T such that U is a solution of that equation. Maybe I won't write it again, or I erase it, so maybe I'll write it again. Uh, of U T one word series by u zero. So let me tell you why, why this is a, a little surprising. So let me try to draw something that you may know. So suppose that I take an annulus and I take a graph over that annulus. I would spend the next five minutes trying to draw it. So you can imagine, I guess, the graph over that annulus, right? It's something that has a hole in the middle. The evolution of this set, we know that in finite time, this is gonna become like that, right? And then this, this inner part is gonna disappear. So I have a graph that has a hole here, and when I approach this time, I have something appearing, and the topology of the graph is actually changing at that time. And then it keeps evolving and eventually the graph disappears and becomes a point. But you can also have the opposite phenomenon. I mean, you could have, for instance, as your domain, a dumbbell initial condition and have a graph over that. And that graph is something that is connected. And in finite time, this is gonna have a singularity as we know. And the graph is gonna split in two parts and each of them are gonna evolve separately. So in some sense, I mean, this is sort of related to the singularities. I mean, so in some sense, it seems like our solution should be related to the singularities of the set. And what we proved, our second theorem, is that in fact, uh, in some sense, the graph uh, uh, agrees with the level set solution. The second theorem is that the, the domain of the graph I'm not gonna be very precise, but agrees with the level set solution. maybe in two minutes or in five minutes, I'll try to give you uh, an idea of, of what are the key elements in the proofs of this theorem and the first theorem that I state, or like some of the things that are important in these two. And I also, I also should mention maybe that the first theorem was localized by the same authors to prove interior estimates for any mean curvature flow. So actually 
this seems like a very particular case, but it sort of gives you estimate in very general cases as well. Um, so, so maybe the key element here is the following function. And it's something that you can see also if you try to start to study, for instance, star-shaped evolution. So I'll write a function that will look very innocent here. So this is what is called the, the height function. This is a normal. This is a normal and this is a fixed vector. That for me the fixed vector is gonna be the graphical direction but then if you want to localize the estimates, you can pick this to be any fixed vector and, and sort of try to work out the same sort of estimates that I'm going to show you here. Or that I, know, I don't know if I'm going to show, but I'm going to mention here. And this actually in the graphical case, you can see that it's exactly this quantity. So actually having estimates for this is the same as having estimates for the gradient. And it turns out that the V satisfies a very good equation. So if you have that V at zero is something good, then V is gonna be good for all times. So the key, the key element basically is the, that V satisfies a very good equation. But I, got, I, I will write, and it will be the only equation that I will write. So this is uh, d d t minus v. So it's something that is very, very good for the maximum principle in, in particular. I'm writing the wrong equation, I'm mixing the equations. Sorry about that. So. So basically, all, all the game here in, in the two theorems is to use the fact that this is a bounded thing for all times, because you start with, with this being bounded, to prove that all the other geometric quantities are also good and bounded, okay? And there's one more thing that uh, I, I don't think I have much time to talk about here, but because you're dealing with something that is non-compact, usually you will need to, or one would need to localize the estimates and try to work on a compact set. There are many different techniques to do that. Uh, the one that I wanted to do here is the one that we worked on our paper, in, in this paper, and we use the function u to localize. Basically, we take uh, powers of the function u minus some constant that is sort of cutting the function, and that's why we need it to be proper to localize the estimates only to compact sets. And then usually you work on compact sets, you see that you have uniform estimates and you see that you can take limits. That is sort of the main idea of this. And because I guess I'm, I don't have time to talk about any estimates, I'm gonna finish here. Thank you. Any 